you're teetering on the edge of a diagnosis of diabetes. Maybe you've just gone over the precipice. You've Googled, what is the best diet for diabetes and high blood pressure? The advice is to go low carb. Aish, that's a tough pill to swallow. Carbs are an intimate part of your cultural identity. Going low carb will spark an existential crisis. You'll be an outcast, unable to socialize with friends and family, continuously scrambling to find something acceptable to eat, and it will cost a fortune. These are the reactions of many Asian Indians to the suggestion to go low carb. Rice is us. The reaction is not something unique to Asian Indians. Around the world, many cultures are glued together with high-carb staples. Rice dominates the plates of many Asian cultures. Where I live on the tip of the African continent, the staple is maize meal. We call it pap. It's eaten as slap pap, which is wet, in the morning, and stava pap, which is hard, in the evening. In fact, we've got a processed version that can be prepared in a jiffy. And our government adds all sorts of things to it to make sure people are getting all the nutrients they need to be strong and healthy. Of course, this may not always be a good thing. Curious? Watch this video to learn more. Other African staples include rice, cowpea, cassava, plantain, sorghum. And eating high-carb staples is not just part of the cultural identity of third-world populations. Many first-world cultures have a carb-based cuisine too. Wheat and potatoes are European favorites. Back to the Asian culture clash. This was something very much on the minds of a group of researchers based in New Delhi. They knew rice was untouchable, but they wanted to help people in their community make the necessary body chemistry changes without foregoing their cultural identity. And, well, they succeeded. Join us for this episode of Better Body Chemistry TV as we explore a way to keep the traditional high-carb foods, but at the same time, minimize the metabolic risk. Better Body Chemistry TV is brought to you by Dr. Sandy, a scientist turned gremlin buster, helping you battle sugar gremlins, heifer lumps, and other health horribles through better body chemistry. Remember, small things can make a big difference to your health. Now, as I said, the rice was still in. The people that were signed up for the study were all considered to be pre-diabetic. But despite this label, they were permitted to keep the rice on their plate. Now, they did get additional dietary counseling. Mm, the advice was pretty standard, not all of which I would agree with. They were encouraged to eat vegetables and fruit, whole grains, high fiber foods, fat free or low fat dairy, and they were also encouraged to limit their consumption of ultra processed foods and sugar sweetened beverages. On top of this, they were told to move more. All participants were advised to include a 45-minute brisk walk into their daily routine. Now, in the study, what was switched was their pre-meal practices. Building on a body of work that has found that almonds are able to reduce post-dinner glucose spikes, our team required the participants to eat a small bag of almonds 30 minutes before breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The small bag was provided by the researchers and came ready to go. Each bag contained 20 grams of raw, unsalted nuts, which amounts to around 16 to 17 individual nuts. Now, the only variable the team monitored was nut consumption. The people in the intervention arm of the study were required to eat the nuts or else and the control peeps were expected to not eat any nuts at all. Along the way, dietary data was collected using a 24-hour dietary recall. Now, when all was said and done, the nuts made very little difference to the carb count, but they did make a significant difference to the body chemistry. Sugar spikes were consistently lower. The study lasted for 90 days, and this is the average glucose level for 30 randomly selected days. 
And in addition, the improved postprandial glucose levels had body chemistry benefits. All of the big five parameters associated with metabolic syndrome improved. Here I'm showing you the results for the fasting glucose level. The team noted that 23.3% of the participants eating nuts were cured. Their numbers improved enough to be considered normoglycemic. Now, to put this in perspective, one of the drugs that's often prescribed to treat prediabetes, Arcabobos, has pretty much the same cure rate of around 25%. So, almonds are a drug-free solution, which tastes great. And most of the people in the study found that the almond intervention worked for them popping little packets of nuts in their handbag or briefcase to consume before meals was easy to do. The nuts tasted good and they felt healthy. So why does it work? Well, one of the reasons almonds work is they're seriously hard to digest. In fact, researchers suggest a lot of the time the digesting of nuts is often incomplete. You can watch this video to learn more. In addition to this, almonds are high in fat, specifically monounsaturated fat. And fat digestion is always a slower process. The detection of fat in a meal sparks the release of a hormone called cholestrocytokinin, or CCK for short. CCK hits the brakes on gastric emptying, discouraging further consumption, so that the digestive tract can take stock of the situation and clear the fat backlog. Consequences of this, everything slows to a crawl, including the uptake of glucose. By timing that packet of nuts to go 30 minutes before you eat, you end up trying to eat that meal in the full throes of the nut digestion operation. Your stomach says, mm, no thanks. So you eat less, and the glucose that comes with dinner struggles to get out of the starting gate. So even if your insulin release is compromised, thanks to bad body chemistry, the dinner sugar is not a problem. Because, well, there's no rush. Delays in getting the glucose gates up go virtually unnoticed. So a sugar spike into the stratosphere is avoided. And as an added benefit, the free fatty acids complement the insulin release. So you get a little extra insulin to boot. Plus, your microbiota love them. Uh, maybe too much. Mm, too many almonds can create an explosive situation. And in my neck of the woods, almonds are pretty pricey. So... I'm not advocating you cure your prediabetes with the almond diet. But a packet of almonds is one of those things you can add to your toolbox to keep your sugar spikes in check. The carb pass will give you more suggestions. And if you want a little more personal help putting together your toolkit to minimize sugar spikes and other metabolic troubles, pick my brain during a day of Voxa. I've spent years studying insulin resistance, and I'm good at identifying the leverage points that will apply to your biology. My blog, Better Body Chemistry, has tons of resources to help you begin the journey to creating better body chemistry and better health. The advice is simple to follow and based on real science, not hype. Know someone who is on the edge of being diabetic or just gone over the edge, share this video with them so they can add a handful of almonds to their stop sugar spike strategy. And if this is your first time here, be sure to subscribe to our channel so you catch future episodes of Better Body Chemistry TV. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Remember, small things can make a big difference to your health.